And with that, I believe we are live on YouTube. Hello, everyone out there. It's great to be with you all this evening. Um, appreciate you all joining us uh, tonight for a presentation of the Frederick County Civil War Roundtable. Uh, my name is John Lustria. I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, we're hosting the program tonight. And we hope you all enjoy. It's going to be a good one. We're talking about uh, John Muller here is going to talk in just a little bit uh, about Frederick Douglass uh, and his visits to Frederick County and the surrounding areas. Um, so you're in for a treat. It's going to be a good time. Uh, and uh, I'll and if you like these videos, uh, be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine's YouTube channel. Uh, and stay tuned, we, uh, the regular meetings of the Frederick County Civil War Roundtable uh, come through the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, um, especially these days uh, in the world of virtual <laughs> programming. And if you have any questions during the presentation, make sure you type them in the comments. We'll get to them at the end of the program. So with all that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Matt Borders. Thank you, John, and thank you once again to the National Museum of Civil War Medicine for hosting us for our meetings. It has been a real boon to the roundtable to be able to have this partnership, not only for our usual meeting space, but for the digital footprint that we now have out there for getting them out, even in inclement weather like tonight, and of course, with the ongoing issues with the pandemic. Now tonight, everyone, we have a fantastic speaker for you. John Muller is an accomplished author. He has written the book, The Lion of Anacostia about Frederick Douglass and his time in Washington, DC. But he is gonna be speaking to us tonight specifically about Douglass's travels after the Civil War and those in those important years immediately following the war, the reconstruction era, has begun and it's actually even going to be moving into the late reconstruction era. And this is gonna be a very interesting talk looking at one of these giants of the civil war era and how they affect and operate in and around Frederick County and Frederick City in the years following. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our speaker this evening, John Muller and again, as John said from the Medical Museum, if you do have questions, type them into that comment screen and we will pick them up towards the end. But again, everyone welcome our speaker this evening, John Muller. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. If you can hear me, raise your hand, ask questions, fire away. Uh, we are very capable moderators. Wanted to just briefly thank the uh, National Museum for Civil War Medicine on uh, downtown Frederick. Give a shout out to the Claire Barton uh, uh, house at 7th and E Street, uh, downtown Washington. Also shout out to uh, my good friend, man, Matt Borders. He, uh, we, him and I have talked over the years when I kind of come through Monocacy uh, field, uh, the National uh, Service site there, uh, because Battle Monocacy for any Washingtonian knows is very sacred because uh, the folks were, the Confederates were slowed up at Battle Monocacy in Frederick County before moving down Georgia Avenue uh, at the Battle of Fort Stevens and the Union repelled Confederates. So anyway, so you can't know about, you can't be interested in Fort Stevens and Georgia Avenue if you don't know about Battle Monocacy. So shout out to Matt Borders and his uh, guardianship of that history. And I really appreciate the invitation tonight. So I could talk pretty quickly. I have 30 slides, 704. I will try to wrap this about 745-ish. So I'll try to move quickly. If people do have questions, please type them in. I'm, I'm not moderating anyway, so, so just send them on YouTube or Facebook, whatever method you're uh, viewing in tonight. So with no further ado, uh, Frederick Douglass, hopefully folks just know the basics. He was born in Slaper, 18, Tall County, Maryland. He escaped slavery out of Baltimore, 1838. He meets with Lincoln during the Civil War. Uh, he's Harry Perkson, he wrote a book in 1845, published a newspaper before the Civil War, meets with Lincoln, uh, meets with Lincoln, in fact, just weeks before Lincoln is assassinated in Washington. Uh, for those of you, you know, Frederick Count, Frederick Tony, and uh, you know, a road station. And so um, the history of Frederick Douglass in Frederick County, 
is after the Civil War, specifically April of 1879, he visited, which actually black on my screen here, but you can see hopefully on your screen, uh, the advertisement to the right uh, announcing Douglas's lecture, and he lectured in Frederick City to benefit Quinn Chapel Methodist Episcopal Church, which is uh, extant today on Third Street, uh, right off of Market Street, kind of in, uh, I guess they call it the upper Frederick uh, I can it's downtown. It's right, so uh, this visits Western Maryland frequently, the Maryland 6th District, uh, through church networks, through political networks. I'll get a little bit more into into visits he made to Hagerstown and Cumberland. He actually even spoke in Frostburg. So he was very diligent in the Maryland 6th District in the Western Maryland, speaking at events and advocating for rights of uh, Black Marylanders, uh, Appala Appalachian Maryland, Western Marylanders. And uh, these, just on the slide, I have many more images to share with you tonight. In the, uh, Douglas is obviously to the left, take up this Matthew Brady photograph. And in the middle, Bishop Alexander Walker Wayman. Bishop Wayman uh, spoke at dedicatory services and laid cornerstones in churches throughout Frederick County, Washington County, Allegheny County. Uh, there's a Wayman AME church in Frederick uh, County. I do not believe the actual town, but it's kind of more of a Burkittsville area, Petersville district, but there's a Wayman AME church was the pastor you guys can fact check me for going live I, he was the pastor at Quinn Chapel during the Civil War dear friends with Frederick Douglass he was babysat by Frederick Douglass's wife he eulogized Frederick Douglass in Washington he was the pastor at Quinn Chapel and uh I do history a certain way I kind of take it to the community there should be I believe for trails some sort of presentation outside of Quinn Chapel. Now, of course, with conjunction of church leaders, Amy leadership out of, you know, Baltimore Conference, DC, et cetera. But there's, uh, the Quinn Chapel is just a very historic sacred site. And this gentleman was the pastor there during uh, the Civil War, friends with Douglas to the right is Lewis McComas, who was a Congressman and Senator out of the Maryland uh, Sixth District. He was actually from Hagerstown, but he was very involved in Frederick. So these are just some quick slides, no further ado. Should go to the next slide. Let's see. Uh, let me. Okay. So uh, I actually uh, grew up on the country road of Georgia Avenue, Georgia, New Hampshire, Sunshine Burger, Sherwood High School, Sandy Spring, um, not right kind of outside Washington. Uh, we used to go to Frederick Keys games as a kid. So just as a background, personally, this uh, Frederick Douglass Snowden. Snowden is a very prominent name. Uh, black American descended communities. Uh, it's also white Snowdens, but Snowdens, uh, I went to school with them. There's a Frederick Douglass Snowden head, so 1897, 1946. This is a copy of my book from outside Howard Chapel Road Cemetery, uh, which is actually in Unity, Maryland, kind of between um, Howard County, Montgomery County, so the Montgomery County side. So some of this sacred history that I grew up uh taking as a child i have now let's say as an adult so this history is, is very sacred uh for 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 folks that grew up around here because these were communities that frederick douglas knew and so that's why we're here tonight to learn more about douglas and frederick county he was uh, affiliated with montgomery county all right so this could be some uh from frederick county uh, the gentleman on the right, their relations with Frederick County are uh, escaping Frederick County via the Underground Railroad. The gentleman in the middle is Thomas J. Dorsey. He was out of uh, Liberty Town, uh, Frederick County. Uh, him and his brothers escaped in the 1830s. Uh, Thomas J. goes to Philadelphia. He's a prominent caterer. affiliated with his family. To the right is Frederick Fowler. Frederick Fowler escaped 1858 out of Newmarket. Um, he is a veteran of the Civil War, as you can see uh, in this picture. He was very involved in Washington, D.C., uh, Grand Army of the Republic. He worked at the Library of Congress uh, with Ainsworth Spofford and 
Douglas knew both of these gentlemen who were Frederick Countyans, Black Americans who escaped uh, out of Frederick County via the Underground Railroad. And, and um, they just, they, they, they those, those guys could be presentations in themselves. To the left is John Robert Clifford, who's really more affiliated uh, with Martinsburg, West Virginia Store College, but he was involved in practicing law. He was the first Black American lawyer to practice in Washington, to Allegheny County, Washington County. He was involved in political rallies in Frederick frequently when uh, there would be emancipation parades, other uh, rallies for Black Americans where bands would perform. J.R. Clifford was a frequent uh, speaker in Frederick City. He was closely affiliated with Mr. Douglas. Uh, he was not a native uh, Marylander, but uh, very closely affiliated with Frederick City. All right, these guys, Benjamin Tucker Tanner, he is the pastor of Quinn Chapel AME following the Civil War. I will speak about him more specifically. Henry O. Wagoner is from Hagerstown, lifelong friends with Douglas. Um, his Henry O. Wagoner Jr. went to law school, the gentleman from Frederick County. Uh, the gentleman to the right is James W.C. Pennington. Probably a lot of people know him. He is well represented. Uh, he was from Hagerstown, the future of blacksmith. He actually was a Presbyterian minister and officiated Frederick Douglass' uh, marriage in 1838. These are all guys affiliated with essentially Western Maryland. Really, you guys know it's in, in, in Frederick, you take the main road down to Georgetown. All these guys, which is me, Tanner and Wagner were affiliated with Georgetown, shared the stage with Douglas um, in places in Georgetown. All right, these are some more kind of uh, loosely affiliated, especially for our Civil War um, scholar. On the left is George Alfred Townsend. Uh, he was from the Eastern Shore. He was a correspondent. He wrote a book about uh, the search for John Wilkes Booth. Uh, he found people that the government couldn't find. His connection to Washington County is Gathlin State Park. Uh, was his uh, kind of summer estate. He lived there from 1884 to the early 1900s. George Alfred Townsend was friends with Frederick Douglass, friends with Mark Twain. Uh, encouraged people to go visit Gathlin State Park today. It's right actually on the border of Frederick and Washington County, right outside of Burkittsville, of where uh, there were students who attended Howard University. Frederick Douglass knew the Battle of South Mountain. Some know it was in 1862, right before uh, Battle of Antietam. And at the Battle of South Mountain, Ohioan Rutherford B. Hayes was wounded. He's the only American president who was wounded in the Civil War. Um, president McKinley was also there at the Battle of South Mountain. Rutherford B. Hayes appointed Frederick Douglass United States Marshal of the District 1877-1881. Rutherford B. Hayes is the 19th president. Uh, there's no representation, no representation for Rutherford B. Hayes at South Mountain that I've found in years of going out there. Um, interesting. To the right is, uh, you guys know him, radical fellow, John Brown, who um, is more affiliated with, let's say, Washington County, John Brown headquarters. He was scouting out Washington, uh, places in Washington County, obviously preparing for his attack on Harvest in October 59. Um, he stayed, John Brown stays at the Washington House in under the library has that record book there uh, at the library and Douglas stayed at Washington House. He spoke in Hagerstown. All right. Okay, so the um, try to get through this quickly is that uh, Douglas was very involved in Maryland politics. He knew he lobbied and advocated uh, Maryland governors, uh, mayors, congressmen, senators, uh, just as he did in other states. And, and it was obviously near and dear to him because he was a Marylander, but he advocated for uh, Black Americans and descendant communities. So in 1879, he made three visits to Western Maryland, the Maryland 6th District. I'll focus on Frederick City a little, little later, but quickly in April 879, he delivered the self made men speech at City Hall Alley, a restaurant. I'm sure any folks have dined there at North Market Street. Uh, proceeds from the lecture benefited Quinn Chapel AME Church. He spoke in Hagerstown, April uh, 2979. He delivered the same speech. 
self-made men. And he spoke in the extant Washington County Courthouse, Washington and Jonathan Street, uh, built in 1872. Lecture proceeds to Douglas's lecture in Hagerstown went to Bennett went to benefit Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is today Ebenezer Amy Church, right off of Jonathan Street. So Douglas spoke to benefit the Amy Church in Frederick as well as Hagerstown. In Hagerstown, Douglas was introduced by local law lawyer Louis E. McComas, who would later represent Maryland in the United States House of Representatives in the United States Senate, very involved in the Republican Party in the state of Maryland. That's how Douglas knew this fellow. He knew McComas introduced Douglas before McComas was, was elected. Douglas lodged the Washington House, as I mentioned, uh, where John Brown had stayed. And Douglas spoke at Emancipation Day event in Cumberland, of which future governor, former Congressman Lloyd Lowndes was present. All right, this is a uh, there's really an opportunity with several partners. I didn't put the National Park Service on here, but National Park Service could be included. Civil War Trails, Preservation in Maryland, which is reportedly doing a significant reinterpretive plan for Battle of South Mountain, Gathlin State Park. We encourage them to reach out to, uh, to me. You have Visit Frederick, who we work with to promote walking towards um, heart of the Civil War Heritage Area, which heart of the Civil War Heritage Area includes Frederick County, Washington County, and Carroll County. Frederick Douglass spoke in all three of those counties. He spoke in Westminster in 1870, Hagerstown 79, Frederick 79. We really, with the support of the Civil War Roundtable, National Museum of Civil War Medicine, we really, as, as, as historians, as a community, need to do something to put together Frederick Douglass and Western Maryland Heritage Trail and about these associations and connections and relationships he had in the community. It's really, really important. Uh, Mr. Key, who's the leader of uh, ARCH in Frederick uh, City, Frederick County, I know they're planning on opening a museum in 2023. We look forward to uh, continuing the ongoing conversations and hope to begin to develop more sustainable working relationships with these organizations. Also wanted to acknowledge the Honorable Mary Mannix of the Frederick County Public Library, see where Arts Building at the Maryland Room. She's a wonderful uh, street reference librarian and community activist or community historical activist. And so my comments are a little reserved, but there really is an opportunity working with Maryland heritage areas, commerce, tourism, all of these departments and partners, um, because we there's a great opportunity to tell a history and to educate folks. And with all the activism that was happening last year, really now is a great time to do this. So now we'll get into some of the straight history. So Frederick Douglass is connected to Frederick Countyans, he knows the ministers that are working within Frederick County. There is, there are a pipeline from Baltimore to Frederick, obviously through the National Road. It's created, you know, 1807, 1808, goes from Baltimore straight through Frederick County communities. So Douglas had uh, been invited and accepted uh, opportunities to speak at emanci emancipation uh, celebrations in both 1867 and 1869. Now, excuse me, he was unable to make these engagements. It's nothing untoward. He frequently, uh, due to uh, whether it be weather, uh, emergencies, political emergencies, all sorts of things, sometimes was unable to make uh, these engagements. I think it's very, that was, uh, was very deliberate in how he moved. And so his accepting these, in, these, these speaking engagements uh, in the immediate wake of the, in the immediate years after the Civil War demonstrated how important uh, Frederick County, Frederick City, those communities, descendant communities and peoples uh, were, and how important he felt it to touch in, the, in these areas. So 1870, you have the 15th Amendment. 
first generation of congressmen, senators going into the halls of Congress, which I'm actually going to read that in another slide. But so the context of uh, Bergen County underwent reconstruction, as well did the entirety of Maryland. Western Maryland, historically, Maryland 6th District has been more uh, pro-union, uh, more anti-slavery, just in the, the orientation of Methodism, uh, the Lutheran. It's kind of almost through the, the, the religious uh, churches you can see. These are these denominations. So that said, though, there were still essentially set up reconstruction. Uh, Freedmen's Bureau set up free, uh, schools in, in Western Maryland, in specifically Frederick County. Now, okay, I'll get I'll get back I'll get back to the schools. I'm sorry, I'm size are gonna be a little out of order here. But um, this print is the Freedmen's Bureau. And the army officer is standing in between uh, white mob and black folks uh, armed as well. All right, so the history of Douglas and Frederick City and County, I have to focus on Quinn Chapel. It's just kind of as a, as a, as a reference point. Quinn Chapel is at is on Third uh, Street uh, today. That folk the Stanton Church. Now the Quinn Chapel, which was an originally Bethel congregation, is actually founded, um, according to records, in 1794. So this is actually almost 20 years before the AME Church is formally organized in 1860 by Richard Allen. So it's a very, very, very old denomination. Um, so the origins go back to 1794. Um, in 1817, leaders of the growing AME denomination appointed William Paul Quinn among his first itinerant ministers. His charge at that time included Frederick City, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where Dickinson College is, where uh, many, many famous Marylanders went, Tawny went there, Chambersburg and Shippensburg, PA. The Bethel AME Church in Frederick at that time worshiped in a log cabin shop next to the present day church. Um, in 1818 is when the first wood structure, uh, independent wood structure was built. And Bishop Wayman uh, made observation that Frederick, Maryland is one of the oldest stations in the state of Maryland outside of Baltimore, saying that the church was rebuilt in 1855 and remodeled in 1870. It is now one of the best stations in Western Maryland. Now, if you look at the current church today, the bottom right is where the cornerstone is that is in the middle of your screen now. It says rebuilt in 1878. Frederick Douglass spoke in 79 to benefit the church, maybe to help pay off the mortgage, help buy school books for the Sunday school. Um, and it was his current, the, the exterior, I believe, was remodeled in 1923. But then if you look directly over the door, top of the door, there's a cornerstone that says 1855. So I'm not a uh, architectural historian. I actually not totally studied up on the records, but I believe that the, the exterior represents several different uh, uh, construction patterns of the church, including the 1855 uh, pattern. But maybe if someone knows they can make a comment and questions to correct me if I'm wrong. But the point about it is it's a very, very old extant church. Now, where this is located, this is, uh, I believe this is the 18... 73 Titus map of Frederick and this um, if you're let's see let's orient ourselves on East Third Street if you're looking at uh, Fourth Ward going up and you look to the right a dot meth dot ch that's the African Methodist Church right there. And this 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 map is available at the library for review as well as online. So this gentleman, Bishop Wayman, Bishop Alexander Walker Wayman, he's the seventh bishop of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. He was freeborn on the Tuckahoe, uh, Caroline County, Maryland, in 1821. He was essentially born on the opposite side of the Tuckahoe from where Frederick Douglass was born in Talbot County. Bishop Wayman was childhood friends with Anna Murray, who was his babysitter. Bishop Wayman departed to the Eastern Shore for Baltimore City in 1840 to join the AME Church. He pastored Quinn Chapel during the American Civil War. 
travel for decades on the national road by stagecoach as well as by train. For almost a half century, he traveled Western Maryland. Bishop Wayman assisted in dedicatory services and cornerstones everywhere. Series Bethel AME Church by Gathlin State Park, Bishop Wayman laid the cornerstone in April 1870. Laid the cornerstone of Frostburg. Laid the cornerstone come Merlin. Laid the cornerstones everywhere. He eulogized Frederick Douglass at Metropolitan Amy Church in Washington, D.C. in February of 1895. Dear friends of Frederick Douglass. Friends with everybody. Friend Frederick Bishop Wayman. After six step back. Uh, in uh, Bishop Wayman was a prolific uh, chronicler of African Methodist activity uh, in the 1800s. Early morning, 29, it's met for the first time in this part of the state, that being Frederick, and it was really a real curiosity. It was said by one man that he had never saw such a fine looking set of color. And he went so far as to say, surely they must be white men with black skins. I believe that's a joke. That was kind of repeated as sometimes the humor a little lost across the centuries. Reverend James Anderson Handy preached the annual sermon. Bishop Handy is on the bottom photo. He was mentored by Frederick Douglass in Baltimore, born 1826. Bishop Handy was friends with Royal Republican Progressive Politics. Christmas Day, 1876, Bishop Wayman writes, and I went there as a man who stood up. He's talking about Frederick. It was difficult travel to get out to uh, Frederick at that time, probably some it's on the ground. On Monday, Christmas Day, 1876, Bishop Wayman assisted Bishop John M. Brown in the dedication at Frederick, Maryland. I believe this was the dedicatory service for the construction that would com be completed uh, or, or work towards towards 1870. I have to kind of get the chronology here correct. But Bishop Wayman is deeply connected and affiliated with Quinn Chapel. Probably told his friend, Frederick Douglass, Mr. Douglass, you should speak in Frederick to benefit the church I passed. Bishop Tucker Tanner, he pastored a church in Georgetown during the Civil War. He was assisted in establishing a school for Black folks in Washington City by the Washington Navy Yard with the support of Admiral John Dahlgren. Admiral John Dahlgren's widow owned the Battle of South, excuse me, owned the South Mountain Inn. Hence the name Dahlgren Chapel on the Appalachian Trail. John Dahlgren worked with Bishop Tucker Tanner, who served as who served as a pastor at Quinn Chapel African Methodist Church in Frederick City during Reconstruction following the American Civil War. Bishop Tanner established school for the Freedmen's Bureau in Frederick County, in Washington County. He was involved with Tulsa's Chapel, Sharpsburg. He established the Emancipation Day Parade in Frederick City. Bishop Tanner worked throughout Western Maryland and the Midwestern United States. Bishop Tanner was involved in setting up schools throughout to educate children and descendant communities, freedmen and their sons and daughters. Here's a document available, all public records via the National Archives. This is a listing of the attendance, the location and attendance of Freedmen's Bureau schools. Location of the school, name of the teacher. Um, under what um, patronage is being support? This is the Baltimore uh, Association. The number of pupils. You can see, Frederick City has two schools. One school has forty-one students. Another school has fifty-four students. Mount Pleasant, sixty-nine students. New Market, fifty-eight. Liberty Town, forty-six. Uh, it's a. They believe that's Middle Middletown. That's. 38, 
Petersville, which is uh, Burkittsville, 42. Then we get into Washington County. All right, and this is, I believe this is, I don't have the date, excuse me. This is, I believe, 67 or 68. These schools would grow in Frederick uh, County. Where would these students go? What would happen to these students after they attended these Freedmen's Bureau schools and learned their ABCs and one, two, threes? Well, they would go down to Howard University, right there in George Avenue. I want to acknowledge uh, Streets of Washington blog, the Honorable John D. Ferrari. Uh, this is courtesy of Streets of Washington. This is a very, very old timey print of the main main campus or main building, main hall on uh, uh, Howard's campus. This actually was raised in the early 20s. This is where Moreland Spingarn Research Center stands today. And you'll see right there is George Avenue. These Frederick County descendant families and communities could have taken the omnibus, the metro bus, the metro from Maryland 26 to Maryland 97. Maryland 97 being Georgia Avenue, one of the most traveled thoroughfares in American Civil War by Confederates and unions alike. During the service of uh, Douglas to the Board of Howard University from 1871 to 1895, students from descendant communities of Frederick County and nearby areas attended the co ed integrated university in Washington, D.C., near Virginia, General Oliver Otis Howard head of the Freedmen's Bureau following the Civil War. Some of you know your uh, local Civil War history. General Howard served in areas throughout the valleys and gaps of Western Maryland. There is a Civil War trail marker for General Howard outside of, I want to say, St. John's Episcopal Church in Hagerstown, right across from the library, because uh, General Howard used that bell tower to look out over uh, the theater of war. When Frederick Douglass is on the board of Howard, University, there are students from the Frederick County descended communities of Adamstown, Burkittsville, Frederick City, Hopeland, Knoxville, Liberty Town, Petersville, Sunnyside, and Yarrowsburg. We need to tell this history. Those, those students from Howard University, as well as political networks, are most likely all of the people who are lobbying Mr. Douglas to speak in Western Maryland, and specifically Frederick. This gentleman, Governor Lloyd Lowndes, I won't, I'm a little behind on time, so I'll just fast forward. He was a congressman representing the Maryland 6th District from 73 to 75. He faced um, re-election. Frederick Douglas wrote a letter in support of his uh, re-election. Democratic papers of Western Maryland have demonstrated their sacred regard for the truth by asserting that Frederick Douglass was opposing the election of Honorable Lloyd Lowndes. Frederick Douglass addressed a letter to the editor of the Cumberland News in which he asserts that he is decidedly and emphatically in favor of the election of Mr. Lowndes and should vote for him if he lived in the district, which includes Frederick City and Frederick County. Frederick Douglass was very active in the Maryland 6th District. April 1879, Frederick Douglass stepped down, touched down in Frederick City. His lecture, I, this was on the early slides where anyone who's joined us just reads that uh, Douglass would deliver the self-made men address at City Hall, which that building is extant today as Brewer's Alley on Market Street. Douglass was speaking to benefit the Third Street Church, which is Quinn Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Who was he with when he spoke in Frederick? He was with some interesting, uh, uh, interesting friends. Now, when Douglas is uh, visiting Frederick, he's serving as United States Marshal of the District of Columbia. He shared the stage with native Fredericktonian Dr. Lewis Henry Steiner. Born 1827, past 1892. Some of you know, I'm sure my our friends at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine 
know that Dr. Steiner was a physician affiliated with the Army of the Potomac and the U.S. Sanitary Commission. Following the Civil War, Steiner advocated for schools for Black Americans, descended communities in Frederick, the city of Frederick County, in the area, throughout Maryland, throughout Western Maryland. He was, he was, he was, he was a friend to Black Americans. He was a friend of Frederick Douglass. He shared the stage with Frederick Douglass and Frederick. What more can you ask for this gentleman? He was there on the stage in Brewer's Alley. We should do something to present this history. Because Mr. Steiner is very, uh, he's, 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 he's almost as talented as Mr. Douglas, let's say. Because not only was he uh, an educator, served his country in the Civil War, but he served as the head librarian for Enoch Pratt Library when it opened in Baltimore City in 1884. He served as the chief librarian until his death. 1992. Why is that consequential? Because Enoch Pratt Library was never segregated. It was always integrated. It was always open to everybody. Why would it be open to everybody? Because Dr. Steiner from Frederick City was open to everybody. He educated everybody. And specifically, he advocated for education for Black Americans. He was from Frederick, friends of Frederick Douglass. And uh, this is a little bit of, I believe Frederick Douglass actually spoke in the library. We're, we're working with our friends at Pratt Library to find those records that would in fact confirm that. But here we have in 1879, five years before Dr. Steiner serves as chief librarian, he's sharing the stage with Frederick Douglass. You'll see Mr. Charles Miller, Dr. Steiner. Another Steiner as well, General John Steiner. Good family, good folks. Another gentleman of note is Reverend Francis J. Peck. Francis J. Peck was on stage. Reverend, Amy Reverend. Reverend Peck is buried in Frederick County, buried in Knoxville. Reverend Peck's father was Nathaniel Peck. He was a pastor of Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Baltimore when Frederick Bailey was an enslaved person in Baltimore. Let's, let's, try, to, let's try to make these connections. Frederick Douglass lectures in Frederick City with the son of the minister who Frederick, uh, one of the many ministers, black ministers who Frederick Douglass looked up to in Baltimore. When Frederick Douglass was on the board of Howard University, he knew Reverend Peck's son who went to law school at Howard University with classmates from Frederick County, Frederick City. Got to connect all these things. It's not that difficult. Mr. McNeil and I with Lost History Associates can make heritage markers literally overnight. So... Like I said, Reverend Peck is buried in Knoxville. Some of you know Mount Zion Amy Church is right there in the middle of Knoxville, right adjacent to the CNO Canal. The railroad tracks are right there. It's right across uh, the river from Jefferson County, um, Harpers Ferry, right near Washington. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is City Hall. This is where Douglas spoke. That is an older um, print, I believe this from the early 1900s. City Hall, Brewer's Alley. That is City Hall today. Which Frederick City is actually does does a very wonderful job of denoting its Civil War history. Kemp Hall, all of the buildings significant to the uh, uh, legislators meeting uh, during the Civil War to keep Maryland in the Union, passing the state uh, constitution November 64. Uh, and Frederick is a beautiful historic city. So we do want to uh, applaud our our friends, therefore, uh, preservationist friends, public historians uh, in Frederick. And you can see the Civil War trails markers right there to the left. All right, we're coming up uh, pretty good on time. It's about 7.40. I kind of closed my screen here so I can't see anybody. But we'll, I have a couple more slides left that um, 
try to wrap this up in about five, 10 minutes. So um, reconstruction in Western Maryland. When Douglas is speaking in Western Maryland in Frederick, uh, this is during the era of what uh, folks would consider reconstruction. And and I'll just read here with the passage of the 15th Amendment in May 1870, the first generation of African-Americans began to enter the halls of Congress. Uh, there were 21 black American congressmen from 1870 to 1901. Uh, curiously, Maryland was not represented among those states. Maryland's sixth district of which Frederick City, Frederick County is included uh, in today and has historically been, uh, was the only district uh, following the Civil War to about 1900 that remained Republican, that remained essentially um, friendly to the, the what Frederick Douglass was advocating for. So the fact that Maryland 6th was Republican meant that Frederick Douglass uh, wanted to keep it Republican. That's why one of the many reasons he was so active in this area of the state. Now, when the 15th Amendment passed, some of you Douglasonians will know that his youngest son, Charles Douglas, was in the gallery, actually, and essentially writing a letter to his father that said people were, were calling out your name. There were many folks that encouraged Frederick Douglass to make a run for Congress from either New York State and or to uh, try to kind of use the political networks to represent Maryland. Uh, the folks that encouraged him to do this were his friends, family, as well as fellow politicians. For many reasons, uh, Douglas did not do so. Uh, but I just think that's very, very interesting because if he had made a run, the Maryland 6th District, interestingly enough, I could make the argument would have been the most favorable potentially to him, not necessarily a district from Baltimore. But anyway, no, well, nonetheless. Douglas actively supported the Maryland Republican Party, and he worked with Maryland delegates who attended the National Convention. Maryland's 6th District was a battleground in which Frederick Douglass was deeply connected through Congressman and Senator Louis McComas of Hagerstown, who McComas, as I mentioned earlier, introduced uh, U.S. Marshal Frederick Douglass in April 1879 at the extant Washington County Courthouse. The culmination of the Maryland uh, Republican Party following the Civil War was action of Governor Lloyd Lowndes in 1895, so from 1895 to uh, 1900. And he, um, Douglas did not get to see this, but Douglas was friends with, with Lloyd Lowndes. Uh, Lloyd Lowndes had accompanied Frederick Douglas in Cumberland. And Lloyd Lowndes, his name was from the Lloyd family, and some know that Francis Scott Key married a Lloyd. And Francis Got key married Chase Lloyd House um, and Doug Flag. Um, the AME Minister Network in Frederick County is closely affiliated with Frederick Douglass. He knew them all, basically. Uh, so, real quickly, the two news articles here are. Um, These actually were from my presentations a little further west. So you will forgive my momentary reflection that these are just showing that essentially the Maryland 6th District was just a real, uh, very fascinating uh, place following the Civil War politically. The only, it was the only district that essentially maintained public leadership of which Lewis McComas uh, came out of. Um, The article to the left is discussing the re-election of Lloyd Lowndes, and the article in the middle is quite interestingly enough saying that the first uh, black American to serve on a jury in the state of Maryland was the lone black voter basically in Bear County, which was named for the head of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad who Douglas knew. All right, Mr. McComas, uh, he's just an interesting fellow. He was a congressman from Maryland from 1883 to 1891, uh, senator from 1899 to 1906, Excuse me, that's nice. Actually, should say 1905. He uh, was the secretary of the 1892 Republican National Convention in Minnesota, which was the last Republican convention that Frederick Douglass attended. 
and here is a Republican ticket, courtesy of the incomparable Al Feldstein of Allegheny County for the Maryland 6th Congressional District in 1888, of which Douglas campaigned for uh, Harrison. Harrison won and appointed Douglas as minister to Haiti, and Harrison visited Cumberland. Um, actually had dinner with Lloyd Lowndes at his uh, home on Washington Street. And um, McComas went to Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, which many uh, folks from Frederick um, went to. And McComas was very active in political rallies in Frederick uh, throughout his career. All right, this is nearby Hagerstown. The historic postcard of the Washington County Courthouse where Marshall Douglas delivered his lecture in Hagerstown. The building stands today at Washington and Jonathan Street. To the left is a notice of Marshall Frederick Douglass's lecture in Hagerstown. The gentleman Joseph P. Shreves on the bottom is who's posting this. The lecture is going to benefit Bethel AME Church in Hagerstown. Joseph P. Shreves was from where, ladies and gentlemen? He was from Frederick County. When Douglas is in Washington, he stays, excuse me, when Douglas is in Hagerstown, he stays at the Washington house. John Brown had stayed there with his sons under the alias of Isaac Smith before his failed raid on Harpers Ferry's federal arsenal in 1859. While in Hagerstown in late April 79, Marshall Douglas had lodged at the Washington house. Today, the Baldwin House is built in its place, which houses the University of Maryland uh, satellite campuses. Okay, to kind of close this out, it's about 747, so I think we're trying not to speak too quickly, try not to be too curt, give you a full portraiture of some of this history, at least a couple of glimpses, is for those of you who are interested in the Civil War, which I would have to presume that you are, being that we're speaking to the Civil War Roundtable of Frederick County and the National Museum for Civil War Medicine. Uh, I would encourage folks to visit uh, Gathlin State Park, which this is on the side of the War Correspondence Arch. And Frederick Douglass knew the first, he knew several gentlemen there, but he knew Governor Lloyd Lowndes, he knew George Alfred Townsend. There's a Townsend picture with Mark Twain, there's Lloyd Lowndes on the um, right, the Battle of South Mountain uh, happens right before the Battle of Antietam. I don't know that Frederick Douglass ever visited uh, George Alfred Townsend, but he was friends with them. But I like going there, and it's a great uh, site. And this is where Rutherford B. Hayes was wounded. There's no representation for that there, unfortunately, yet. All us, whoever is working on that. So Lost History Associates, Mr. Justin McNeil was not on this presentation this evening, but he usually, we work together. Him, Mr. McNeil and I have formed Lost History Associates, which you can find out more information at website, losthistoryusa.com. Uh, there are Instagram, Twitter, on Facebook. You can find out more discursive notes on Frederick Douglass at line of Anacostia, wordpress.com. You can find out information about walking tours, upcoming Annapolis, Baltimore, Cambridge, Denton, Capitol Hill, Frederick, Athens State Park, Harpers Ferry, Old Anacostia, 7th Street, Georgia Avenue. And with that said, I will kick it back to Matt and John, and I'll put it back on the first slide so we can just have a good, um, should, I, should I unshare my screen? Uh, either way, John, I think... I think we can get the questions out to you either way. Sure. Okay. Well, first off, thank you. Why don't we leave it? This this is a nice visual, right? Yes, exactly. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for, for having for the me, guys. Um, I actually do have a couple of questions. Uh, how are, do we have any from the general populace, John? Uh, no questions yet from the the comments, but a number of uh, of folks tuning in. Uh, Mark Collins and Todd Morris, Gary Dyson, Sam Modding, I'll say hello. Oh, um, and, uh, Mr. 
Mr. Collins. And, uh, Mr. Collins is a is an honorable history teacher in Shortest County. Well, and and uh, Mark Collins also uh, says later, uh, well researched and sourced. Wish the internet connection was better, uh, but the upside is I get to see this without risking life and limb. So, especially in the, uh, snowy, snowy days like this. Um, but no, no questions from the comments yet. Uh, might get some rolling in. Uh, Matt, you mentioned you had some uh, a question or two. I do. Um, John, one of your earliest slides that you put up was of some gentlemen who had actually utilized the um, Underground Railroad through Frederick County. Um, you said they had specifically escaped from Frederick County. Do you have any idea where they had escaped from? Do you know who was their quote unquote master, if you will, or owner? Um, it's part of the ongoing research that we're always doing for the formerly enslaved population here in the county. Yes. Yes, thank you for that question, Matt. Um, uh, Dr. Kamal McLaren uh, is currently the Maryland and or like Mid-Atlantic DC Maryland uh, representative for the Network to Freedom. Um, mm -hmm. yep. And Dr. McLaren worked at, the, was the curator of the Frederick Douglass National Historic Site for I believe 10 years, maybe a little longer than that. Uh, he contributed a uh, very kindly a forward to the Douglas and DC book several years ago. And um, I've, Mr. McNeil and I with Lost History have been in touch with uh, Dr. McLaren and Diane Miller of the Network to Freedom about um, specifically the Dorsey brothers or the Dorsey case. And it's really, it's four brothers, um, Matt, and um, it's, it's four brothers and Douglas was very closely affiliated with Thomas J. Dorsey specifically, who was in um, settled in Philadelphia and was a very prominent caterer. Um, and uh, Douglas was essentially really the Douglas family was family friends with the Dorsey family. Douglas's daughter stays with the Dorsey family in Philadelphia during the Civil War, actually. But um, they were the Dorseys were from. Liberty Town. Now, mm, okay. when the brothers when the brothers leave Liberty Town, which, not to give all the details, but I'll just say that Mr. McNeil and I basically tracked the route, and quickly is that the the route out of Frederick County, um, the road essentially that, that runs from Emmitsburg to Gettysburg or excuse me, runs through Emmitsburg to Gettysburg, which I don't really even know what that road is. It goes past the, the college, the, the main road, I'm, right. I'm sorry. But then there's also Georgia Avenue, but Georgia Avenue, you uh, would have to take, as I mentioned, Maryland 26. And you basically take it, is it, is it 75? I guess Maryland 75, 75 and 26 intersects. And you take 26, you take 26 um, east, and then you, when you hit Maryland 97, you make the left and go due north and you get right to Gettysburg. You go through Littlestown, McAllister Mill, and you get literally you take that, that road leads into right there, center of Gettysburg, where there's what? It's a York Road, Carlisle Road, Chambersburg Road. And you have like Baltimore Pike or Baltimore Road, which becomes Georgia Avenue, and becomes 97. So I say that because the, the Dorsey brothers escape out or, or, or leave, flee from Liberty Town. And they take what is still an old country road, I guess, in Liberty Town. So I'm just not, I just don't feel that uh, currently is nothing as you, Matt. You're a good man. I do trust you, but I just uh, rather not give the exact address. But basically, that is there. That, that is there. Where they left from is there. Or the property is there. The farm is there. You know, it's kind of back in the cut. And, uh, but you take that road to, um, you take you take that road, uh, two twenty six, and then you take twenty six and ninety seven. You get to Gettysburg, and uh, get, Georgia Avenue. Uh, John T. Lewis. He was friends with uh, Mark Twain. He was involved. He was involved with the Brethren. Some of you know. You know your Civil War history. John T. Lewis was the gentleman who got the 
Bible from the Dunker Church returned like in early 1900s because John Lewis was the Black American Brethren. Because in Western Maryland, you have Methodists, but you also have Brethrens and or I guess they would be like Lutherans. And the, 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 the Germanics were anti-slavery. Methodists were anti-slavery. So long, long answer is that the Dorsey brothers, work has been done, Matt uh, and John, to um, and everybody else potentially listening, is that there have been, as a community historian, street historian, it's my responsibility to maintain a certain amount of ethics and integrity. So I say that because research has been done to an extent on Thomas J. Dorsey. Thomas J. Dorsey's son was W.E.B. Du Bois did a study on the Philadelphia Negro, I believe was like the title. And it was one of Dorsey's sons. So Dorsey was very, very prominent. So people know about Thomas J. Dorsey and another brother, Basil Dorsey. He settled in Massachusetts. I want to say Northampton, maybe Florence, Massachusetts. And so his home in Massachusetts is denoted as a network to freedom site, but not his site that he left from in, in, in Frederick County. And I mean, all due respect, it's just like, I don't, you know, it's, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why these, uh, you know, local, local historical politics, local politics, national politics, state politics, why, you know, a lot of this work is just, you know, to say it politely, is just kind of like incomplete. And so I say that because like the, the Dorsey brothers or their cases are known in like in the Chester, in Chester, 1883 history of Chester County Underground Railroad. Robert Purvis, who's out of Philadelphia, writes that basically one of the most interesting cases that I was ever involved with was the Dorsey brothers. Because they all basically when they get to when they get over the Mason Dixon line, they all essentially go in different directions. And they have like different sorts of cases or different sorts of stories. So so the one gentleman, the other gentleman is Frederick Fowler, who is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. I should mention that um, John Robert Clifford is buried in Arlington as well, you know, Civil War, USCT history. Is that Frederick Fowler escaped from Newmarket, which sometimes the Dorsey brothers are just the real general Googling, let's say, we'll say that the Dorsey brothers were from Newmarket, but more specifically, they were from Liberty Town, but it's kind of like, the, it's the same road, I want to say it's 75. But anyway, but the, the Frederick Fowler is more specifically from Newmarket, and I want to say it's Dr. Willis, I don't have that those specific notes in front of me, but Frederick Fowler escapes, he's a very interesting, actually goes up north, he works, he works, he's um, in Connecticut, upstate New York, and then enlists in the Civil War. And I believe he serves, I believe he wants, serves like out of Connecticut, but he's essentially a, you know, a, a Maryland native or a Marylander, but he's not serving in, what was it? The Maryland 7th Regiment was most, mainly color, U.S. Color Troop. I don't, I don't have those notes. So, sorry if I'm getting that a little mistaken, but so anyway, so in a, Frederick Fowler um, works at the Library of Congress. Uh, he Douglas helped or worked with Ainsworth Spofford at the Library of Congress. John Cresswell at the post office. Uh, John Cresswell went to Dickinson College, where Wilcomins went, where Tawny went. Cresswell helps to integrate the post office. These were nationally controlled in terms of federal patronage. So, so, so Frederick Fowler, who's from Frederick County, works at the Library of Congress from 1876 until his passing. I want to say, well, he works 1876. So about the early 1900s, he passes in the early 1900s, um, and he was very involved in the Grand Army of the Republic uh, membership and leadership in Washington. And so, and, and Frederick Fowler has been written about in the Journal of Negro History. There was like a brief article about him in like the 20s, maybe. And there's a book that my uh, my honorable friend Justin McNeil has that he basically he he him and his kids like study from this book. It's called uh, Black Defenders Black Defenders of America. And Frederick Fowler is in there. Hmm. And um, that was a long answer to your question, but because we didn't get any other questions, I figured I'd be a little extemporaneous. That's uh, all right. Yes, we, we did get one in. Well, first of all, uh, Ken Derenbacher says uh, lots of Dorseys are still in the area. Um, Definitely. 
speaking mm -hmm. to the, uh, the last question there. Uh, but Todd asked, uh, Frederick County staying Republican while other nearby counties uh, remain Democrat seems counterintuitive. Can you speak to that a bit? Sure. Um, well, to get a little more discursive than most people may want, but I will nonetheless, is there was a book published in the, I believe, like 1970 called The Negro in Maryland Politics, 1870 to 1910. Uh, Cal Cott is the author. I believe it's Johns Hopkins University Press. Once again, the book is called um, The Negro in Maryland Politics, 1870 to 1910. And it talks about how it just it would, it talks about inter Maryland politics, but specifically about how the, the the Republican Party just kind of never got over the hump in the state, and they had John Cresswell was a senator from Maryland who ran appoints postmaster general, and the failure of the Republican Party it was blamed at Cresswell's feet. This is like in the eighteen eighties. And so I say that in terms of the Maryland 6th District remains Republican, whereas for those of you who know, basically the basics of Maryland Civil War history is that whereas the Civil War divided the country north-south, it divided the state of Maryland east-west. The right. Eastern Shore, Cambridge, Denton, Chestertown, those areas were very, uh, the planter, agrarian, aristocracy, the ruling class of Maryland. Maryland has a thing where every center, or had it, Eastern Shore had to be represented with one senator. So the Eastern Shore was or the Eastern Shore was the power base. Eastern Shore was Confederate. Annapolis was very some more ball, very uh, you know, pro-Confederate. So Maryland, the vote to keep Maryland in the Union is taken in Frederick. The vote to uh to um the, to pass the Maryland uh, Constitution in October, in November 64, that, that abolishes slavery. It's the only, Maryland's the only state to buy Constitution before the Civil War abolished slavery. Um, and so uh, these are done in, was it Kemp Hall? Is that right? Kemp Hall, it's like right there on Market yeah. Street. It's done in Frederick, whereas that Frederick was the orientation of Western Maryland was less agrarian based would have had, uh, I mean, blacksmiths and tinsmiths and 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 drivers or you know uh, or small smaller farms or family farms, family farms. Whereas, and you had the settlement of you know uh, of of Germans where Germans were anti-slavery, but also Germans essentially they, it's a trite way to say, it, but they only like really work with their family members. They didn't really have like enslaved persons. And these are obviously reflected in all the records. And in just terms of the overall black population was just was um, lower than it was in other areas of this, the, the, the uh, state. And you had also the, obviously the strong method uh, Methodist fervor, which is anti-slavery. So the orientation of Western Maryland was more about uh, it, it. They didn't have the same, let's say animosity or opposition to freedmen's rights or, 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 or black Americans' rights. And that's a very, very simple way to say it. But then also, now obviously there's other issues within um, Republican politics and Garrett County is named after Don Garrett, who was, who was very involved in the Republican Party. So anyway, so I say that because, so, so Maryland is, the, is a place where, although there's not a large percentage of uh, black voters, the black voters were viewed as like let's say a swing vote in the Maryland 6th District. Now at this time, Maryland 6th District also includes Montgomery County. So Montgomery County is a little higher black population. But anyway, so the Maryland 6th District, other than I believe William Walsh defeated defeated Lloyd Lowndes, other than I think one, one term from following the Civil War until the early 1900s, um, the Maryland 6th District was always Republican. And then also the uh, first, um, the first, uh, 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 non-male, the first female congresswoman, I believe, I believe that was Lewis McComas's granddaughter. She's also out of the Maryland 6th District. Oh, even like Western Maryland's more um, 
kind of like women's women's rights or voting rights, which is also kind of like, you know, in, in the Western, the Western part of the country. So I'm not a total f- political scientist. I probably wasn't the, the clearest answer, but it is very interesting that the, that the Maryland 6th district, I say that because Douglas knew this and that's, and he, and he knew these politicians. And so he, he was very active and, uh, I think that I think that is like maybe so it's like counterintuitive because today you would see like oh, I don't even want to touch this issue, but like you're, you're just you're just uh, actually I don't want to say anything controversial. <laughs> it is it it, it 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 is interesting, and uh, I leave it to people who are a little more studied in the history of the state than I to speak on it. But uh, the basically the congressmen from Western Maryland were advocates for Freeman for Freeman's rights. Were friends of Frederick Douglass. During the Civil War, and so I think this fact, this fact as well as other, is why it's improper to do something to honor Frederick Douglass in Western Maryland, and also honor these connections that he that he had. All right, that's uh, that's all I'm seeing uh, from the comments in terms of questions at this time. Todd did say uh, thank you for for the response, um, so people are watching out there. Um, which is uh, which is good, but yeah, that that's all I'm seeing from the comments at this time. Excellent. I've got one, hopefully, um, one that just piggybacks off what we were just discussing, John. And then we'll call it a night. But in '64, Maryland gets a new state constitution that abolishes slavery within the boundaries of the state, except for punishment. But in 67, many of the improvements to African-American suffrage and freedoms within the state were curtailed by the 1867 Constitution. Um, Do you have any information or idea in regards to what Frederick Douglass's opinions of the 67 Constitution was? And maybe that was why one of many reasons why he wasn't able to make it out this way earlier. Uh, Perhaps he was not too pleased with the direction Maryland tried to go or did go uh, with that, that constitution. Matt, that is a wonderful question. And I will just say quite honestly, I really, I don't know the specifics um, of his. <laughs> so, uh, there was the guy, Hugh, I believe Hugh, Hugh Lennox Bond. Hugh Lennox Bond was, I guess, a, a judge uh, within the state of Maryland and or like a federal judge but within the federal uh, system that applied to Maryland. And Hugh Lennox Bond is someone that uh, Douglas was friends with and or he was, he would use these networks to, to lobby. In almost every incident, he, he would, he would, um, he would use these networks to expand the voting rights um, for Black Americans, you know, uh, access to education, um, uh, you know, anti-discrimination in public facilities, hotels, restaurants, streetcars, uh, the, the railroads, and Douglas was um, the, the the he didn't he didn't come in 67, 69. And one of the I didn't have this research, but one of the times he came, I believe he uh, I think he was over he was overbooked one time. I believe he was supposed to be in Ohio or something. He essentially had to make a decision. That he had he over this he owed this person a greater favor than he felt he had to to to, to, to visit i think it was middletown uh but sure. also in in this period of time I, I don't know the specifics of the 67 constitution other than essentially that like what you're saying is that maryland um and like arthur poe gorman was not particularly favorable to enfranchisement for black americans and maryland maintained a level of um voting rights for black Americans up until I believe like the early 1900s is when the state really started to repeal and or put restrictions on those voting rights. But you're right, in, in, in Maryland has the 64 constitution, then has the 67 constitution. The 67 constitution also created, um, you probably know more than I, but basically where former s- slave owners or slaveholders could file for um file for what is it restitution or they could fi- they could make a claim to the state and say okay well and this is and this has to do with the second confiscation act which the second confiscation act 
in the state of Maryland, whereas you have in the state, you have um, slave holding pro-unionists and whether or not their politics were really pro-union. It's more like, for example, like on the Eastern shore, you had like the, the Baker family or the Lloyd family or some of these, the, or the Ringgolds or the Tillmans, which I guess the Tillmans were, like Ringgolds and Tillmans have affiliated with Washington County, but they were from the Eastern shore. But so you have these, these families that had um, estates that had, you know, uh, enslaved persons, they, with Maryland and its situation as a border state, took the position where they were supporting the union and it could have an, an, an enslaved persons and then Emancipation Proclamation, which I mean, I know obviously people know this, but doesn't administratively apply to Maryland. So then you have essentially the second Confiscation Act, which created so that in the, like in areas of, I, I don't know Western Maryland as well, but it's the Eastern Shore, but like the Eastern Shore, there's families that, that um, well, there's situations where slaves would run away from Maryland and the military would return those folks. And then about a year later, they left and then they would, their enlistment, their enlistment, like a uh, sign up fee would be given to the, uh, the slaveholder, the slave owner. And then so after this, after the Civil War, the second confiscation act, which allowed it, basically what it did is it, it the, the, the loyal, the unionist loyalty of the slave holders in the state of Maryland is what prevented the federal government and or Lincoln from coming in and seizing the, the land and the property. I mean, I, um, correct me if I'm kind of wrong, but that's a little bit of my understanding, which goes back to the second time. The 1867 constitution is where you would had the, the, the vote to keep Maryland in the union, the vote of the, the, uh, Constitution of 64, some know that Lincoln imprisoned a lot of pro-Confederate or Confederate sympathizers of Fort McHenry. And there's some people that say that, you know, the vote that was taken was he arbitrarily kind of controlled or stacked the deck where it was pro-Union. So then when you had following Civil War, the loyalty of, you had some of those more, um, you know, kind of, I mean, it's just very trite to say Confederate, but Confederate sort of leaning folks that get into the state government and then you have the, the rollback of those uh uh those kind of rights to freedom and i i feel like i'm kind of stumbling on that answer because right. i don't really have a specific answer to give you but what douglas's comments were or I, I don't know but his he advocated with hugh lennox bond and hugh lennox bond was essentially an inside guy in maryland that advocated on the legal side for rights of black folks and and stop and i should oh, say too, that the guy uh, signed it yeah, he, yeah, Hugh, Hugh Lennox Bond is very interesting, and then, and then in terms of also with that uh, Steiner is um, uh, Dr. Lewis Henry Steiner is in the Maryland Senate in the early 1870s, and so he he would have been someone as what well. like so, and then you had Western Western Maryland representation to the state house, the state delegates, the state senate is more pro. Uh, black American rights or, or freedmen's rights. Excellent. Excellent. That's well, John, um, thank you once again for joining us this evening. I know it was a, a bit of a struggle with internet connections and all that, but we got through it and I think we got some great information out there. So I greatly appreciate it. Of course, our friends and colleagues at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, thank you as always for hosting us. Everyone, we will be back next month on the third Thursday of the month for another in-depth discussion on a topic for the Frederick County Civil War Roundtable. I'm kind of keeping the schedule in the air right now because we have had a number of changes that we've had to weather due to the pandemic primarily. So um, we will confirm our next month's speaker as soon as I can confirm it with <laughs> who's on the schedule. But regardless, again, thank you. Thank you, John, for joining us this evening. And thank you, John, for hosting us. And I want everybody to have a great night and be safe out there in the snow and the pandemic. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me.